Okay, we're back for part three. Um, we have about 40, 42, 45 minutes in so far. Uh, we should finish in less than 30 minutes in part three. Hopefully, hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully. Let's try. So the second reading, globalization and decentralization, lessons in good governance from China and India. Publication date. Well, there isn't one. There wasn't one on the original. It was a draft, so it's undated. We can kind of look at references to get a feeling for the date, but I've erased all the references from you, so you can't see that. But there is something inside that tells us that this was probably written around the same time as that book review, around 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, something like that. Um, consider any author bias. Well, uh, I haven't looked at this author. You could. Um, but there's nothing in here that really gives us a strong feeling of bias, so we don't really need to worry about it. And it's a draft. There's no publication. There's not much to look at. So in that regard, just look at this for some ideas. Don't treat it as something that is true or not true. We're looking at ideas. Part of my focus, uh, my belief in public administration, a master's degree, a university study in general, is that professors don't have all the answers. We can only tell you what various people think, what various people are saying, and especially for you as master's degree students, you will be a master. That means you are trained to be a teacher, trained to examine information and figure out what's good information and what's less good. So, in that regard, by sharing more thoughts and more information with you, you can then make good choices. You can make more choices. So, let's start. A uh, quick introduction before we jump into the article. China and India feature a federal or quasi-federal system. Well, what does that mean? Perhaps it's easier to compare to a unitary system. Unitary is basically the opposite. A unitary system is one where the central government is the only government. And anything below that exists because the central government gives permission. Unitary governments come from the concept that the king was put there by God. So the king has all the power that God gave. And lower levels of government don't really exist. The government can give permission for lower levels of government to do something, but the king can also take that away. That's a unitary system. So a federal system is kind of the opposite. The federal system is where various smaller governments agree to come together to share power. Not to give up all power, but to share power. So for example, in the United, in the United States, slow down, it's now uh, 1240 AM. In the United States, 13 separate governments, separate states, agreed to join together to create a larger federal government to help coordinate things. That federal government has gotten stronger, but still the local states still have some autonomous, independent power, and the federal government cannot touch it. I'm sure Donald Trump was very shocked to discover he was not the CEO of USA. He was the chief executive of the federal service. But he could not tell governors what to do. Governors 
could and did say no. That's a federal system. United States, Canada, Germany, Switzerland. These are famous federal systems. And then we have India, which is clearly a federal system. The states have certain autonomy. Again, these were places that ultimately were all pulled together by the British uh, colonizers. But prior to that, had a long tradition of being independent countries that fought each other. China, too. Uh, while we have a central government in Beijing, the various provinces have some identified independent power, which is based on the fact that even though China had an emperor who officially had power, the reality was he didn't have much power outside of the areas near Beijing and maybe the areas near Shanghai. The farther you got from the Beijing-Shanghai corridor, the more local areas were controlled by local princes or warlords, kind of generals, who had their own thing. And they would pay some tax to China's emperor so that he wouldn't bother them too much. And they kind of did their own thing. The extreme of that would be Korea. Korea was not part of China, uh, but Korea paid tax. Korea sent money, slave workers, maybe not slaves, but treated as slaves for five years or 10 years, women and other valuables to China as a tax. And I'm sure the, the emperor in China probably felt like Korea was not much different than some of those other areas that were quite far that also had to pay. So how big was China? Who's talking? Whose mind? Who thought it was power? So China had this history of kind of independent governments, and we can use the word quasi-federal there. So federal system is, is the extreme on this end, you know, where local governments, states have a lot of autonomy. Unitary is on this end where governments have uh, no autonomy. All power comes from the central government who can take it away. And fed, fed, a quasi-federal is somewhere kind of kinda more like federal, but not exactly and not really unitary. So that's what we're talking about. Um, the paper talks about intergovernmental relations. In, in English, we sometimes say IGR, intergovernmental relations within the state. Now here state can mean the national level or, the, or the, the intermediate government, the higher level local government, and then finally the lower level. And in some countries there's four levels. Um, so we can look at da, 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 and how does the higher work with the lower. We could also talk about uh, left and right, maybe two cities that are side by side, how do they work together? But left and right, this horizontal relations uh, is not the focus in this paper. We're mostly talking about it, how much autonomy the lower level has. The third thing that this paper talks about is contributions of local government to the national economy or uh, to the national tax base, to employment. So here it's talking about not the cities or the local government saying, oh, please, hire government, give us money. But instead, the local government is saying, hey, because we're doing this, the national government is making money. We gave it to you. We did it. It's our idea. So that it works two ways. So before we jump into this next one, let's go into the article. This one's going to be harder to read. It's smaller type. It's, uh, we're going to just go into the reading quickly. Uh, John Echeverri Ghent. The name is interesting. Okay, His family name is in two parts. This happens. Uh, it could be uh, for a woman. Sometimes it means I take the husband's name, but I keep my name. So I am, uh, you know, my husband's name and my name. 
But in other cases, especially for men, it's often I took my mother's name and my father's name. I'm very proud of my family. And so in this case, Echeverri looks like an Italian or maybe Spanish or French name. And Ghent looks like a Dutch, Netherland or German name. So kind of a South and a North Europe. Interesting name. And his specialty is government and foreign affairs. All right. University of Virginia. Good school. His basic starting point is globalization challenges scholars. Okay. Scholars, people who study things. Globalization gives headaches. It challenges scholars, those scholars who are pushing for the idea of a strong, important developmental role for the state. Developmental role for the state. Korea is the classic example. In 1960, Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world. In 1995, Korea hit the G20, right about 1995, don't know exactly. So call it 35, less than 40 years, Korea hit the G20. How did that happen? It wasn't a miracle. It didn't happen from the stars. The government planned how to develop the economy, how to develop the society. The government said, we're going to organize things. Okay, we're getting charity money from overseas, and we also have some of our own natural resources, especially hard-working, educated people. We're going to organize it and focus it to grow our society. We're going to develop our society. It's called development administration. It's a field of public administration, not so popular anymore. But uh, we could say the Sema Udong was very much a model of developmental administration. The idea of giving money to Hyundai to build roads and to build cars, to, to channel money, to send money to certain businesses and to certain industries is the developmental state. Okay, so for those who argue that the state, the government, is important in development, globalization gives them a headache. It doesn't fit. Not because globalization reduces states' rule, but instead because globalization rewards, encourages certain types of governmental relations, intergovernmental relations. It's not what's taught in developmental administration. It says, until recently, most students of the developmental state, okay, again, students here means people who study. It doesn't mean Hakseng. It probably means people who have a PhD. Baksa, Gyosu. People who study about developmental state. These people have mostly focused on the central state, the central state or have looked at state-society relations. How is the government relating to the people? They haven't talked about how lower-level government works with upper-level government. So their study is missing. This paper wants to look at that missing, that gap. It will argue that globalization has important consequences for IGR. Globalization affects intergovernmental relations. And it's going to look at China and India. He's going to suggest what we're going to talk about in a bit. We're going to skip some of this. Okay. He's going to suggest, he's going to look at, analyze how Chinese and Indian subnational governments, meaning not national but state level, local level, have affected, have played in the government in the country's development. All right? That's the main focus. So um, we can see here the World Bank World Development Gov Report for 1999-2000. There's a hint that this paper was done around that time or a little bit later. All right? It was actually published in 1999. 
Globalization incites countries to reach out to international party, international partners. Incites, encourage, pushes, excites, makes you, oh, I want to do this. Globalization is helping governments decide that they should reach out internationally. Is that good or bad? That's a different question. Does it make things better or weaker? Well, globalization has two important consequences for intergovernmental relations. Again, the focus here is intergovernmental. Since you are fact our staff in a lower level government, intergovernmental relations should be of interest. Not just the national government telling you what to do, but the idea that maybe you can negotiate back and forth. What are these impacts, consequences? First, increasing international flows of capital and trade. Capital means money and valuable things. Enhance, improves the incentives for autonomous action of subnational governments. Because businesses are willing to, to invest in more places, subnational governments, the Guchang, the Guangyuxi, the Dochang, they have more reason to try to globalize, to get more things done. And the national government kind of stands back and says, well, that's our job. But if you can do it, go ahead. So more reason for local government. Because if, if, if Susan Guchong can get this international business here and it makes lots of good jobs and there will be fewer university graduates who can't find jobs in Susan Gu, so everybody's happy, there's more taxes being paid, everybody wins. Second, globalization increases the importance of subnational policy for economic development. Well, that's kind of sort of making the same argument. But what it means here is that the national government needs to plan how we can help local governments bring in money. How we can help local governments improve their internationalization, their globalization. This paper is focusing almost entirely on economics. So what he talks about here is new economic geography. Well, in a few weeks, we're going to talk about new economic geography in a massive scale, about how regions of cities can become even more important than the governments they work in. Okay. There's a lot more to globalization than the exogenous increase in rewards of international economic transactions. Exogenous means the outside, the things we can see easily. So there's more to globalization than just the money, the rewards we see in financial transactions, economic transactions, building a factory, bringing in low quality goods, workers work on it, exporting high quality goods and uh, Profit stays in the country because those workers now have more money to buy more things. Right. Globalization has produced important changes in the spatial patterns of economic transactions. It's not only country to country, it now becomes place to place. But again, we're talking money here. Quite often, changes in economic geography have promoted new spatial inequalities that pose challenges for subnational and national governments. How come all the businesses are going to this place and not that place? Why do they want to build a new international airport in Busan, not in Daegu? That's not fair. It means all the, all the economic advantage is going to Daegu. Boom, there you go, right? It's an international airport. If you build it in Busan, most of the benefit will be in Busan. If you built it in Daegu, most of the benefit would be in Daegu. Unfortunately, Daegu doesn't have the right space to build a big international airport. Uh, I'm not saying I'm for Busan. I'm definitely not 
for Miriam where I live and I, I can tell you why, I, but I wrote a paper on that, that's not important. But um, if you want to know my true opinion, they should improve Kime because it's a long time before we need much more. But I don't get to vote on that. That's concluding remarks. More of the same. Okay. The many types of incentives created by international, by intergovernmental relations will change the developmental role of subnational governments. Then he talks about it in China. Okay. I'm, I'm not spending much time on this paper because we don't want to stay here forever and ever. Our time is just about over. I'm going to close this. Summarizing, China and in India, we can see that highly centralized structures of intergovernmental life, of, a, of intergovernmental authority. Technically, they are federal or quasi-federal, but the central government dominates much more than the U.S. And the U.S. is much more now than it was 80 years ago, much more, more, more than it was 150 years ago. And U.S. is much more centralized than Canada, much more centralized than Australia, much more centralized than Germany, much more centralized than Switzerland. More centralized structures exist in China and India than in the U.S. But globalization has created reasons, incentives for decentralization. For example, if if this province or large city can encourage a foreign company to come here, that, that's good. The whole country will win. Uh, if the country try to do it by itself, then they have to try to decide which place, which place, which place. Sometimes let the local government do it. Uh, globalization allows local governments to be more active in their own development. They don't have to be passive. They don't have to wait and hope that the government the national government does something for it. Globalization, in fact, contributes to localization. Localization meaning thinking local, more autonomy, feeling an identity. When we mix globalization and localization, we come up with the word you know, local. Global plus local. And what global and local do, though, is a hollowing out of the center. They are weakening the nation. It's like a donut. We keep cutting in the middle until there's no more middle. Right? And that could be bad. That depends how you see it. However, his study also suggests that in countries where the intrastate authority was relatively weak, relatively decentralized, globalization tends to strengthen centralization. Tendency means I want to do, I more often do, this is the way I prefer to do. So centralizing tendencies are more often going to happen in a place where the intrastate authority was relatively weak relatively decentralized. But on the other hand, in countries that were more centralized, globalization is pushing for more decentralization. That there are decentralizing tendencies more likely to happen in states that were more centralized, like People's Republic of China and India. So what does this mean? Well, first, we have to recognize that these two analyses that he did were primarily about money, primarily economic. Where does money come from? Where does it go? How do we get it? And in our course previously, we talked about economics being only one part, only one part of globalization. And in fact, to be honest, in our class, because we had that week off that I usually do this, we didn't talk much about the various other things that we could include under economics. We only did it softly. Um, but very, very often, 
discussions of globalization focus on the economic. And this article is, and the, the previous article on uh, Japan, basically mostly focusing on economic issues. The second thing these articles mean is that different governmental systems react differently. Okay, we got the more centralized, the less centralized, the unitary. Right? Different kind of government system are going to respond, are going to be affected by and then make changes because of globalization. These different governments will do in different ways. Different governmental systems react differently. So finally, I expect that we will meet next week, April 7th, in the library across the street from Susan Kutung. And I guess that will be our permanent classroom in the weeks forward. So I really hope that I'll see you then. Um, be sure to do the reading for next week. It's not too difficult. It's not too long. And the guy's really famous. So he's worth reading, thinking about. I hope you'll take time to think, what is he saying? Why is he saying? What are the other arguments? Okay? See you next week. Thank you very much.